The Crenshaw Mafia Gangster Bloods are by far one of the most known gangs in America. Whether in the streets, movies, I'm from Africa, I'm from Crenshaw Mafia, or in the news, the violence was shocking. One dead, 11 wounded in a gang drive by shooting Friday night. Their name is always ring bells. This gang is known for their violent ways, the numerous hustlers, and prominent members who have made them one of the most feared, hated, and by far one of the most respected gangs in Los Angeles. Because of this, they definitely have a story to tell. Yeah. All right. Welcome to Cali's Most Dangerous. Let's get into it. Police came to the house. It was about three o'clock when they told me about it and I couldn't believe it because it just was, it just was a real shock. I couldn't believe it. Roy Pete, he was from the Crenshaw Mafia against the Bloods for most of his life, which is a blood gang and a predominant gang in the city of Inglewood, California. He was an original OG and had a lot of members looking up to him. Like Trayvon Atkins, who was one of the newer members of the gang, RYG. Atkins, he was known for bragging, telling a lot of false stories, and often bigging himself up with little or no reputable sources to back his claims up, which resulted in his fellow gang members calling him out on his claims. On January 24th of 1996, Pete, Atkins, and 20 to 30 other men and women were hanging out at 10th Avenue and Bordon Street in Inglewood, California. Teddy Watson, who was an influential gang member, whose street name was T-World, was also there. There was some talk about Atkins that day and about the things he had said he had done in the past. He had bragged about committing crimes and even killing people. So several of the gang members, they challenged Atkins because neither they or Pete have been able to substantiate Atkins' claims. As mentioned already, Atkins was considered to be a braggart and a loudmouth. And at some point, a gang member told Atkins, man, put up or shut up, nigga. So Atkins, who told his fellow gang members he wanted to understood that he was a killer and accepted the challenge. And right after that, Atkins said he would leave and do something to prove himself. That's when Atkins and two of the gang members, they decided to take a ride and see if there were any of the gang's enemies in the neighborhood. Atkins left with Watson and Watson's Cadillac. A third person known as Mad-Eye left with him as well. Pete believed the car Watson was driving belonged to Watson's girlfriend, Trina Scott. Scott's car was yellow, except for the front passenger door, which was a gray color. After Atkins and the others left, the remaining of the gang members stayed and made bets as to whether Atkins would meet the challenge. Now fast forward to about 1 p.m. later that day. Russell Noah was with two friends, Edward Davis and Tremaine Brewer, who were all members of the Hard Time Hustler Crips, with smoke of marijuana and Noah's car, which was parked in the alley. When Noah noticed the medium-sized car, which he believed was a Bates Cadillac, but one of the doors on the passenger side, gray, rolled past. Noah, he could only see two gang members inside the car, but noticed someone running up behind his car from the rear and firing a gun at his car. Suddenly, the shooter was standing right next to Noah. Noah then ducked to his right and heard a lot of rounds being fired. He climbed out the car and saw the shooter running away. Noah, he escaped from the shooting with minor injuries, but Edward Davis and Jermaine Brewer unfortunately died from several gunshot wounds. At the hospital, the officer spoke with Noah on the night of the shooting. Noah identified T-World as a driver of the Cadillac, and he was certain about the identification, but he was not certain who the passenger was, and he never identified the shooter but he did describe him in terms of what he had on. Back at the Crenshaw Mafia Bloods hangout, Pete heard gunshots, 
and Atkins returned shortly after. When Atkins returned, he just kept smiling. Other than smiling, Atkins' response would say, Man, I didn't think I had it in me. Atkins was the first one back. With Watson returning on foot and confirming Atkins, he had taken care of business. And for a while, the cops had no idea what exactly went down that day. But a couple years later, the case went from cold to red hot through the statements and the cooperation from a fellow Crenshaw Mafia member. From 1996 to 1999, P got along with members of the Crenshaw Mafia. But P was arrested for carjacking and various other crimes and faced a sentence of 50 years to life. So P decided to help himself by contacting the police with information about unsolved crimes, including a case that involved Atkins. In late 1999, or in the early 2000s, P told the Inglewood police about Atkins. And on March 13th of 2000, P agreed to be placed in a county jail cell with Atkins, during which they had a 13-hour conversation in which Atkins gave Pete more details about the shooting. During the conversation, he revealed the men in the Cadillac were just about to leave the area when they saw a car parked in the alley. Atkins said he recognized the people in the other car as enemies because he had known him from the California Youth Authority. He also told Pete that he had stolen the bike, which was on the side of the street, and that the two of the gang members remained in the car. Atkins then explained to Pete how he hopped off the bicycle and ran up to the car and just started shooting. Afterwards, when the others tried to get Atkins back in the car, he told him he would ride the bike back. At that time, Atkins he was even more proud of killing the two men. Atkins explained he rode his bike away from the scene because he was aware of another crime scene. The perpetrator had left a bike and when the police found it, they had taken fingerprints from it. This conversation, it was huge for the prosecutor. But at first, nobody else was given any information that would guarantee Atkins' conviction. That's because all the witnesses they were reluctant to give information or cooperate and express their fear over retaliation. Noah, for example, still refused to identify the shooter, but subsequently, after investigators recorded the conversation between Pete and Atkins, an officer confronted Atkins with the audio tape. Atkins then waived his Miranda rights and said he wanted to speak to the officer. He told the officer he had been a gang member for most of his life and had been incarcerated for most of his life as well. So it wasn't a big deal for him. Atkins said that he wouldn't give any information on anybody, including himself. And when he was told murder charges would be filed against him, he never tried to explain away the statements on tape. Carrie Tripp, who was a detective with the Inglewood Police Department, qualified as an expert on gangs. And on January of 1996, the Crenshaw Mafias were feuding with the hard time hustler Crips. Missions to kill rival gang members were being carried out. The purpose was to show everyone else who was a top gang in a respected area. And the best type of work that you could put in against a gang member was to kill a person. And usually, because a killer wants to get away, he enlists the assistance of two or more people. So that one is a shooter, another is a driver, and a third is a lookout, with females usually scouting the territory. When someone is a new or a younger gang member, he will proceed to put in work, which is to attack or fight gang members of another gang. However, there has to be someone else there to see it. Senior members of a gang would not see a younger member put in work if it didn't really happen. When a gang member goes out to put in work, other gang members go with him, so it's unlikely the member would lie about it if he didn't do so. Also, the member would be in serious trouble for not putting in the work. And if he subsequently made up stories to tell the original gangsters, he would be in trouble for lying about it. In the end, through the witness statements, the police investigation, statements from fellow gang members and enemy gang members, 
Atkins, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility to parole, plus 12 years for the gang enhancement. Man, rest in peace to Edward Davis and Tremaine Brewer. Being active members in the 1990s, where gangbanging was at its peak in terms of violence and deaths, choosing to smoke up right next to enemy territory and not being aware of their surroundings ultimately turned out to be a lethal combination. And sadly, it cost them their lives. Look, that's just one situation when it comes to the Crenshaw Mafia against the Bloods. These guys have a history of being one of the most deadly gangs in Los Angeles. But to fully understand this gang's brutal nature, and before we can get into any more situations, it's essential that we go over their history. Neighborhood that started originally in 78. This community started in 78, but it was, you know, before that it was predominantly everything was Inglewood family. But this, you know, this community stood up, you know, a few brothers stood up, stood up and made a stand and wanted, you know, wanted to have no their own identity. And from that came the Crenshaw Mafia. History of the Crenshaw Mafia against the blood. Inglewood, California, it has an in-depth history when it comes to the formation of the majority of gangs in the area. And the Crenshaw Mafias are no exception to this. This is because the gang's foundation can be traced back to the Inglewood family gangster blood. If you guys want some info on that gang, check out their video on my channel after this. Anyways, when it comes to the Crenshaw Mafia's formation, they start off as a spinoff gang from the Inglewood family gangster bloods in around 1981. It's been widely debated that the gang was active before those years though. This is because while the CMGs, which is an abbreviation for the Crenshaw Mafia Gangster Bloods, wasn't officially a gang in the 1970s, they were still already a tight group that often hung out together, partied together, and had each other's back when the cannon defended themselves in their territory against enemy groups and individuals. So them adding the Crenshaw Mafia Blood title with the name coming from the Crenshaw Boulevard Street that the gang resides on only made the group more loyal to each other. And while this gang was definitely younger compared to the already established gangs like the Inglewood families, throughout the gang's history, they've always received a lot of respect, installed fear to their enemies, and have been one of the most popular gangs in Los Angeles. Been widely mentioned by the media, documentaries, and even a few movies, such as Boys in the Hood, with a funny line coming from an interaction between two kids early in the film, and a couple other scenes throughout the movie. The gang has also appeared in films like The Wood, Straight Outta Compton, Remember me, OG Two-Tone. Crenshaw Mafia, bro. And dope. Oh, shit. Look, I'm in cereal. But that's how much I hate crab ass niggas. You know what I mean? Because my mind, it, it thinks these C words, but my mouth won't let me say it. Which is entirely based around 104th Street in Inglewood, California, also known as the Bottoms, which is in the heart of the Crenshaw Mafia's territory. The Bottoms, also known as Bottomville, is located between Century Boulevard on 104th Street in the Darby Village Dictionary, a neighborhood of six blocks dominated by two-story apartments and duplex houses, right off of Crenshaw Boulevard. And when it comes to this area of Inglewood, it has a history of being one of the most dangerous areas to reside in, whether you're a gang member or a civilian. 1980 census data, the Urban Institute measured the underclass. They looked for neighborhoods with an overpopulation of welfare dependents, high school dropouts, female-headed households, and jobless males. They found 880 underclass neighborhoods nationwide, 22 in Los Angeles alone. Throughout the 1980s, all the way up to the 2000s, the Bottoms had a reputation for housing a lot of drug dealers, with the area being widely known for dealers on down near every corner, having multiple violent gang members whose brutality was widely known across the county and had a reputation 
for having a lot of members from the bottoms who are very trigger happy. With a big example being Frank Lewis, who ended up shooting a lady and leaving her paralyzed in 1994 when he was 14 years old. My whole objective is just to get the property from the victims, not to shoot nobody. So I put the gun into the car. The window was partially open and the woman victim started to roll up the window. My whole objective at that point was to just flee. I, I got about a hundred bucks in my pocket at 14. I can get me a bag of weed, some stress and be cool. So as I tried to get the gun out of the window, which was almost all the way rolled up, it went off. and. It shot the victim, the first victim, the driver in the neck. The Crenshaw Mafias have always had a lot of YGs who were known to be completely with the function. But Baby Hawk, being one of the younger members, who was known for a lot in his area. I'm not a role model and I don't want no kid to look up to me. You know, I, I had to do this because this how I was grew up. You know, this how I grew up. I had to get out and do on my own. You know, when I was 12 years old, I was on my own. You know what I'm saying? I wish I didn't have to live that life. You know, unfortunately, I did. Man, rest in peace to Baby Hawk. He got killed trying to defuse an argument that broke out between his homies and some Valley Crips at a football game at Rosita Park. Anyways, it's a lot more members who are known for their daily ways. One member taking the lives of three brothers. One of the LAPD, 17 other divisions has as many murders as 77. Almost one in five of all the city's homicides happen here. In a metropolitan area of several million people, the Washington, D.C. sniper killed 10 people in just three weeks. In 77th Division, with a population of only 175,000, they're seeing an average of 10 murders a month. On the evening of September 27th, 2001, 21-year-old Christopher Florence was driving his car to meet a young woman in the area of 104th and Crenshaw Boulevard in Inglewood, California. Attempting to follow directions, read on a piece of paper, he mistakenly turned right off 104th Street on a 10th Avenue, going the wrong way on a one-way street. This portion of 10th Avenue is the area known as the Bottoms, which was claimed by the Crenshaw Mafias, a blood gang of which Creighton Lewis Armstrong was a member of. Thinking that the car had an enemy in it, he fired shots into the car, striking Christopher several times. Christopher, he was badly injured and drove a few blocks until he crashed into a barrier on Crenshaw Boulevard. And unfortunately, he died a short time later from a bullet wound to his left side. Takesha Webster, who was Armstrong's girlfriend at the time, went to the bottoms the next morning and heard about the shooting. When she asked Armstrong about it, he told her he shot at a car because it was traveling the wrong way on a one-way street, which he believed was a maneuver used by rival gang members before they committed a drive-by shooting. A couple days later, on the morning of September 29th, 2001, two days after Christopher's death, Christopher's mother and his three brothers, Brian, Tori, and Michael Florence, drove to the bottoms, near the area where Christopher had gotten shot. They saw a number of gang members on 10th Avenue, and Michael pointed his finger at them, gesturing he had a gun. Around midnight that same night, a number of people had gathered at the Florence home to mourn the death of Christopher, including his three brothers and their friend, Floyd Watson. In the course of conducting his own investigation into the shooting, Michael received a call from a woman identifying herself as Nicole, who said she had information about Christopher's death and was trying to set up a meeting with him. The four men, they then left the house and Michael's Ford Mustang to get something to eat. Michael then drove the group in search of the place where he was shuttled to meet Nicole. In an area of 104th Street and South Van Ness Avenue. They were driving east on Century and stopped at the intersection of Century and Dottie. And when Watson looked through his rear windshield, he saw a burgundy Ford Contour behind a Mustang in the left lane and noticed Armstrong was leaning out of the window of the passenger side of the Contour, yelling something. Watson told Michael that Armstrong was yelling at him, so Michael began to roll his window down. And once he did that, Armstrong pulled out a gun and started shooting as the Contour moved forward parallel to the Mustang. 
After several gunshots, the contour pulled away, leaving Michael shot in the head and Tori shot in the neck. Brian then jumped into the front seat and steered the Mustang out of the way of traffic. After that, Brian and Watson waved down passing vehicles and left the scene to call for help. When the police arrived, Michael was in the driver's seat, but he wasn't speaking or moving. And Tori, he was laying in the street. When they asked Tori if he knew who the shooters was, he responded, the CMGs, which the officer understood to mean Crenshaw Mafia gangster. Brian and Watson soon returned to the scene and spoke to the police. Brian described the shooter as a light-skinned African-American male in a red sweatshirt, and he indicated that the shooter had fired from a red fort with three other females inside. Based on this description, the officer suspected that there might be a connection between a shooting and an assault that occurred earlier that night at a nearby 7-Eleven store, during which it's alleged that Armstrong had exited the red vehicle outside the 7-Eleven store and approached the man, asking him, where you from? And a few minutes later, Armstrong punched the man in the face. An officer who had, had prior contact with Armstrong reviewed the store surveillance tape and identified Armstrong as the assailant. Also, at the police station later that night, Brian and Watson identified Armstrong in a photographic lineup of known gang members. That same night, Armstrong met with Takesha Webster, got in her car, and directed her to the scene of the second shooting. According to Webster, Armstrong looked at the Mustang and said, I did that. He told her that he pulled up next to the car and asked the occupants where they were from. And then he said he let him have it. Explained that he shot both Tori and Michael. The Inglewood police immediately started to investigate the shooting. And on October 2nd of 2001, Two days after the second shooting, police officers conducted surveillance of a house occupied by Armstrong and his brother, Darren Armstrong. They spotted Armstrong dressed entirely in red, riding as a passenger in a red Ford Contour driven by Tanisha Washington, the car's registered owner. The officers then stopped the car and arrested Armstrong, while also conducting a search of Armstrong's residence, recovering a red Johnny Blaze sweatshirt from Armstrong's closet. Also, on the day of Armstrong's arrest, the police stopped the car being driven by Armstrong's brother, Darren. And after obtaining his consent to search, officers found a loaded 9mm pistol. Ballistics analysts indicated that the bullets recovered from Christopher's car and body and the bullets recovered from the shooting Michael and Tori all had been fired from this weapon. And while the detectives had enough evidence to charge Armstrong with the murders, they had more than enough after a daily situation occurred with Webster. In May of 2002, about seven months after the shootings, the defendant's former girlfriend, Takesha Webster, was living in a temporary Beverly Garland motel under the Witness Protection Program because of her anticipated testimony in a different case. Webster, she was seven months pregnant at the time and her three-year-old daughter, was living with her. She was shuttled to move in a more permanent location and the police detectives who were working with her had recently given her a card that showed the new address. But in the early evening of May 1st, 2002, Webster heard a knock at the door. A female voice said, housekeeping, and Webster, she opened the door. Once she did that, four people rushed into the room, including Armstrong's brother, Darren, and three others. After Webster had been pushed into the bed, Darren questioned her about the money she was supposed to send to Armstrong's jail. And that's why she was in a witness protection program and whether she was snitching on Armstrong. Meanwhile, Webster's younger daughter had been taken into the bathroom. When Webster denied snitching on Armstrong, Darren hit her in the head with the unloaded 9mm handgun. After that, he loaded the gun. The intruder <laughs> over Webster's head and started and at one point, Webster heard Darren answer a telephone call, telling the caller, we found her, and what you want me to do with her? Darren also said they hadn't found any money and asked, should we Uber? 
which Webster understood to mean shoot and kill her. He then put the phone next to Webster's ear. The caller, whose voice Webster recognized as Armstrong, asked why she had not deposited any money into his account. Webster, she had deposited money for Armstrong a few times in the past, but has since stopped doing so. Webster then told Armstrong that she would put money in his account as soon as possible if he told Darren and the others to leave. Darren then took the phone back and continued to talk. And at the call saying, we just going to for then. The group used a to whip and attempt to They also lit some sticks and used them approximately 140 times. They left after taking her clothes and the contents in her wallet. Ordering her not to tell anybody about the incident and also warning her that they knew where her grandmother lived. Detectives interviewed Webster while she was in a hospital being treated for her injuries. That's when she reported to them for the first time that Armstrong told her he was responsible for the murders of the three Florence brothers. Detective Corey Tripp testified at trial as a gang's expert. He told the jury that Armstrong had admitted that he was a member of the Crenshaw Mafia gangsters. Detective Tripp, he also told the jury that none of the Florence brothers was in a police department's gang database. And to his knowledge, none of them were gang members. Brenda Florence, the mother of Christopher, Michael, Tori, and Brian, testified that none of her sons were in gangs or otherwise engaged in criminal activities. After a thorough investigation into the murders of the Florence brothers, statements from fellow gang members and enemies, surveillance evidence, and statements from Armstrong's ex after she was tortured by the Crenshaw Mafia members, the judge found Armstrong guilty of the murder of Christopher Florence, Tory Florence, and Michael Florence. And Armstrong, he was sentenced to a term of death. And this one, it seemed like it was a story straight out of a movie. To kill one person, then kill his brothers a couple days later, is crazy. And on top of that, torturing a woman who wasn't gonna snitch in the first place is insane. But man, we're talking about the Crenshaw Mafia against the Bloods. Sadly, that's pretty much common with this game. A quick update. As of 2023, Armstrong was moved from death row in San Quentin State Prison to the Los Angeles Man Central Jail to await retrial or negotiated plea, maintaining that he only killed the two brothers acting in self-defense. And over the years in prison, Armstrong found a passion for mental health and dedicated himself to expanding the program. Expanding the role from an A-type position to a peer counselor who formed strong bonds with the residents, develops therapeutic and enrichment activities, and de-escalates conflicts. If you guys want a better understanding of what went down in this case, I'll leave a couple links in the description. Anyways, whether this story played out how the prosecutors told the story or not, the tricky part about this is that that's only one situation that shows the nature of how this gang has been known to move in the past. Let's get into who these guys are to get a better understanding of how they moved throughout the gang's operation over the years and to get into some more intense stories. You know what I'm saying? It's a 50-50 chance of you surviving in the goddamn penitentiary. How you think you gonna survive out in the street? You more of a advantage to get killed in the street as you is in the goddamn penitentiary, you know? You could be two days from your damn release date and them up and blast you them up in the head and you go. So what you gonna do then, huh? Think about that though. Who are the Crenshaw Mafia Gangsta Bloods? The Crenshaw Mafia Gang, also known as the Crenshaw Mafia Gangsta Bloods, or the Crenshaw Mafia Gangsters, are an African-American street gang located on the west side of Inglewood, California. Like already mentioned, they were established in the 1980s and named after Crenshaw Boulevard, a street between Century Boulevard and 104th Street. When it comes to the attire, the gang is known to wear coarse, a lot of red. And they sport the Minnesota Twins baseball cap, with the M standing for the mafia partner name. So if you see a nigga with a Twins hat on, nigga just run home. They known for shooting at enemies for a put on. This gang has a history of taking a lot of enemies' lives, shooting at any unfamiliar face that pulls into their area, and unfortunately, 
hitting a lot of innocent bystanders as well. That's why this gang has had several gang injunctions placed on them, with the big one occurring in the late 1990s. On December 17th of 1997, the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office and the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office sought an injunction against the Crenshaw Mafia Bloods, as the gang had been responsible for 19 murders in the preceding four years. The injunction, it came with a plan to turn Inglewood around from the daily reputation it was known for. When a specific plan was adopted in 1998, the area it was experiencing high levels of crime, including drug dealing, murder, robbery, and extortion from local businesses. They also wanted to change the structure of the city, which included impacts from high aircraft noises, physical deterioration, increased costs for property owners, and a diminished quality of life for the residents, which for a short time, seen a positive change in the area. In the two years following the gang injunction, the gang committed no known murders. But by 1999, it was obvious that the Crenshaw Mafia gangster bloods were still around and indeed was still displaying their murderous ways. On November 19th of 1999, at about 8 p.m., Lee Arnold and his friend Gregory Johnson were outside the home shared by Arnold, his uncle, Russell Spratt, on a 3600 block of West 105th Street. Bobby Montague, another man, rode up on bicycles and asked Arnold and Johnson, where you from? In a response of Arnold's denial of gang affiliation, Montague's companion crossed his arms and revealed a gun. Arnold ran to the backyard and jumped into a pen with his two route rollers. Montague and his companion then laid down their bikes and followed Arnold to the backyard. They asked Arnold's cousin, whom they encountered as they entered the yard, if he had seen anyone. And after a few minutes, Arnold's cousin informed the man that they were gone. Arnold, he knew Moniker only by his gay moniker, Baby Johnson. A few minutes later, Spratt looked out his window and saw his nephew, Josan Spratt, talking to the two men. He then saw Arnold emerge from a dog pen and run to the back door. Arnold told Spratt that he had been chased by a man armed with a gun, so Spratt called 911. And while he was on the phone, he heard several gunshots come from behind the house in the direction of 104th Street. When the police finally arrived, they took the bicycles left near Spratt's garage by Montague and his companion. Montague and a gang member known as Spratt, as Spider, arrived at Spratt's house by car five to 10 minutes after the police left. Spratt, he recognized Montague as a friend of a nephew and someone he had seen earlier around the neighborhood. Spider asked Spratt if he had seen the bicycles and Spratt told him the police took them. Montague and Spider then told Spratt he had better get the bikes back. And if he said anything to the police, it was gonna kill him. As they drove away, a second car drove up and the pastor shouted that if Spratt spoke to the police, they would return and kill everybody in the house. Spratt testified, Spider appeared to be about 20 years old. He was six feet and two inches tall and had a mustache, slight beard and long braids. When seen by Spratt, he was wearing black clothing, gloves and a stocking cap. Spratt, he also described Montague as 15 to 16 years old, about five feet eight inches or five feet nine inches tall, bald and wearing black shorts and black and white Converse All-Stars. Spratt identified Montague and Spider from a display of photographs and identified Montague at trial. According to Arnold, Montague's companion was slim, dressed in black, and 25 to 30 years old, with long hair, worn under a hood, and wearing one glove. He also identified Montague, but not Spider from the photograph, and he declined to identify Montague at trial, saying he didn't want to be known as a snitch. All right, so this is when the story gets complicated, or at least takes another term in terms of what went down that night. Y'all definitely got to pay attention. At around 8 p.m., Kashani Telehamaka and his nephew 
find a tour, walk from their apartment building on the 3700 block of 104th Street to the family van parked on the street. A few minutes later, Telemonica's wife, Kafuatu, and his daughter, Tatunga, joined them and the four got into the van. Tahunga testified that as she and her mother were walking towards the van, two African-American boys passed by. Because they were walking in the same direction, she didn't see their faces. Though she said one had long hair and the other had no hair. After her family got into the van, she saw one of the boys turn around and walk towards the van. And as the van started to drive away, someone began shooting into the van through the window. And unfortunately, Tawai was shot five times and died from his result of his wounds. One shot hit Tatunga, who survived. No one from their family was able to identify the shooter. However, Tatunga told the police that the man who approached the van was bald, 16 to 19 years old, thin, five feet, 10 inches tall, and dressed in a dark sweater and pants. Ballistics testings established that the same nine millimeter semi-automatic gun fired all four expended casings found at the scene and in the van. Two bullets removed from Titoa's body and an expended bullet found in the van. Detective Steven Steeler, he interviewed Montague on December 1st of 1999. A videotape of the interview was played at trial. During the interview, Montague admitted that he was a member of the Crenshaw Mafia blood gang. He told the detective that he was walking down 104th Street on November 19th of 1999, when two men frightened him by behaving aggressively toward him. After that, he ran back into his own neighborhood. And armed with guns, he and Spider went back on bicycles to look for the men who scared him. They parked the bikes on 105th Street and waited near their apartments on 104th Street. After that, two men emerged and walked to a van. Montague thought one of them might have been the one who had previously confronted him. He then walked up to the passenger window and fired about four shots, saying Spotted was also shooting. When they went back to get the bikes, a man told them that the police had taken him. Montague, he also told the detectives that he was wearing a pair of black Converse shoes on the night of the shooting. The police later searched Montague's room with the warrant and seized a pair of black and white Converse shoes. The soles of the shoes, however, did not match any of the footprints found at the crime scene. The police, they also found on the dresser in Montague's room a photographic album that contained photographs of gang graffiti and gang members making gang signs. In addition, they found handwritten poetry and rap lyrics on the dresser. In the end, a jury convicted Montague of one count of first degree murder three counts of assault with a semi-automatic firearm, and one count of shooting into an occupied vehicle. And the court sentenced Montague to prison for a total of 38 years to life. Definitely rest in peace to Vuna Tiela. He unfortunately lost his life because of mistaken identity. And although he lived in the neighborhood, but in the Crenshaw Mafia's blood territory, he said he lost his life because of it. This situation fed out with some locals been at the wrong place at the wrong time. But this next one definitely put out with some enemies. But before we can get into all that, we have to address the allies and the enemies of the Crenshaw Mafia against the Bloods. Allies and rivals of the Crenshaw Mafia against the Bloods. What's some of the main factors in the well, it ain't that many of them. The main factors is red and blue, 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 and blue, blue, and blue, blue, and your territory. Them is the main factors. So you're supposed to know where you're at at all times. When you're out of bounds, you know it's the only cracker. The Crenshaw Mafia Gangster Bloods are known for being the most hated gang in Inglewood. So they don't have too many close relationships with other gangs in that area. The few that they do have include the Weirdo Gangster Bloods, the Inglewood Family Gangster Bloods, also located in Inglewood. They're also allies of the Rolling Twenty Neighborhood Bloods, the Harvard Park Grams, the Family Swan Bloods, the Black Peace Stones, the Harvard Park Grams, and the Athens Parks Bloods. And they have a close relationship with the Denver Lane Gangster Blood. 
the West Coast, the West Coast or whatever. It's all nature. We got my mind. Mark your lane. Mark your lane. I got the point. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Crip or something, something. You have beef. He's gone. This alliance is known by the first generation as the Denver Mafia and the Mafia lanes by the second and following generation. Lil Hawk, Lil Laniac, and Big Way dedicated a song to this alliance, which is a track off the Blood and Crips Banging on Wax 2 album. But trust, their relationship goes way deeper than this music. These guys often hang out together, get money together, and commit violent crimes to one another. A big example played out in 2008. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. You know what I'm saying? If that motherfucker that's walking with his kid shot you when you was with your kid, what would you do? That's for the homie Lil Lanny Act, You probably, and you might just have to handle your Lanny Act. But you know what I'm saying? You know, if my brother died like that, you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't give a I wouldn't give a that. If that's that man I want. On the end of June 1st, 2008, Emmett Love Jr was shot in the back of the head at a bus stop in Los Angeles, California. Jackie Wayne heard the gunshots, saw Love fall to the ground, and saw a small black man run into a four-door Mercedes parked in front of a church. The shooting, it was to avenge the May 31st, 2008 killing of Derek Chambers, also known as Baby Hangout, a member of the Denver Lane Gangster Bloods. Eric Davion Boyd, also known as TikTok, was a member of the Crenshaw Mafia Blood Gang, which was affiliated with the Denver Lanes. On the evening of May 31st, 2008, Boyd visited a Denver Lane apartment and announced that Chambers had been killed. He believed that the Hoover gang members had killed Chambers and wanted to retaliate. Kaylin Weisberg, a prostitute who hung out with the Denver Lanes, overheard Bird say, I want to get somebody for you, baby, hang out. After that, people in the apartment made phone calls to locate a handgun. On June 1st of 2008, a candlelit vigil was held for Chambers. Boyd and different lane gang members, Ravon Richardson, also known as Chaos, Casey Plurdu, also known as Half Pint, attended the vigil and left in a black four-door Mercedes after a gang member named Shady gave Purdue a Western revolver. Purdue handed the revolver to Boyd, who said, man, I need this. I got to do this. Before he went on a mission to look for Hilbert gang members to kill. While driving, Boyd saw some kids at a bus stop on Century in Vermont and got out to see if they were over. Richardson then drove around the block and Boyd returned and got back into the Mercedes. Boyd said the kids were gone and directed Richardson to keep going. Further down on Vermont Avenue, Burr saw a black man named Emmett Love at a bus stop. So Burr told Richardson to stop and see if that guy was from Hoover. Burr then got out the car, shot Love, and ran back into the car. Burr, Richardson, and Purdue tried to drive back to the vigil, but ran out of gas. Boy visited the Denver Lane apartments later that night. He was drunk and high, but overall, seemed to be in a calm state. Weisberg heard boy say, I just killed a snoover nigga at the bus stop. And while kissing his gun, he said, I was for you, baby, hang out. I was for you. Purdue left the Denver Lanes in 2009 and told the police that Boyd was a shooter and Richardson, he was a driver. Purdue was then granted immunity and placed in a witness protection program. Boyd was arrested a year after the shooting and told Denver Lane gang members Derek Kelly, who was Wiseboy's boyfriend and pimp about the shooting. Also, a June 24th, 2009 jailhouse conversation was taped. Boyd said the half pint, also known as Purdue, was supposed to jump out. Burgess quoted saying, half pint was supposed to jump out. I really did that. I really did that shit. Kelly asked, who was you with? Burr responded, half pint of chaos. Yeah, half pint fucked up. He was supposed to jump out. Also mentioning, man, a car ran out of gas on 108. And said he suspected that Purdue talked to the police. Quoted saying, 
They know too much. They know some shit I don't even remember. A gang expert, Inglewood police officer Kerry Tripp, testified that the Crenshaw mafias and in different lanes were criminal street gangs whose primary criminal activities included murder, drug sales, and robbery. Officer Tripp opined that the gang shooting was committed for the benefit of the Crenshaw Mafia gang to earn respect and enhance the shooter's stature in the gang. Evidence was received that Derek Chambers, also known as Baby Hangout, was shot on May 31st of 2008, was Richardson's close friend. Richardson had a tattoo that said DLIP Baby Hangout. DLIP stood for Denver Lane and Peace. Los Angeles police detective Peter McCoy opined that Love was shot to avenge Chambers' death. Bird, he denied shooting Love and claimed he didn't match the shooter's description. With respect to the child's recording, Bird stated that he merely told Kelly what he heard from the detectives on the street. When Bird told Kelly that he was with Half Pine and Chaos, he meant to say that he sat in the Mercedes outside the candlelit vigil, drinking and listening to music. But still, through the witness statements, recorded Giles conversations, gang evidence, and statements from fellow gang members, Wade was sentenced to 50 years to life in state prison. Yeah, rest in peace to him in love. He was caught in the middle of a deadly war between the Crenshaw Mafia against the Bloods, the Denver Lane against the Bloods, and the Hoover. And sadly, he became a casualty of it. Yeah, the Crenshaw Mafia's have a history of going at it with the Hoovers, especially throughout the 1990s and the early 2000s. But that's just one enemy of honestly, a lot. When it comes to their other rivals, they have a history of engaging in daily wars with a lot of Crips and even a few Bloods. The rivals of the 102 Raven Avenue Crips, the Mad Ass Gangster Crips, the Imperial Village Crips, the Watergate Crips, the Rolling 60s, the Rolling 40s, the Harlem Crips, and the Tonga Crip gangs. And even have a past of getting into it with other blood gangs, like the neighborhood Pyrus, who they actually used to get along with until a shooting occurred with the two gangs in 1996 over drug sales in their respected areas. We buzzed there, but I got some more niggas though, like the NH Fleas, <laughs> the neighborhood Pyrus, niggas is punks, homie. My nigga Tiptoe, that's my nigga, you know what I'm saying, MIP. So we doing it like that. Unfortunately, we had it with other dogs, but you know, shit happens, shit, them niggas. We killing them up, this Crenshaw Mafia, you know? That's just a few enemies, though. The Crenshaw Mafia gangster bloods are known to engage in intense wars with a lot of other gangs. This is because a lot of this gang's prominent members have always been known to shoot first and ask questions later. Kenny Boy from Crenshaw Mafia Gang. Um, I really, I really just came to say that um, I will whatever my people choose, and you know, I'm just riding with it. Stay up, black people. Prominent figures of the Crenshaw Mafia Gangsta Bloods. The CMGs have a long list of members who made the gang one of the most feared and respected in this area. But before we can get into all that, I found a list of members who are no longer with us. A few of them include Big Ant, Lil Bandit, Lil Biz, Bo, Chinaman, Lil E-Rock, Lil Hawk, Baby Hawk, Lil Scrap, Woody, Eric Malone, and Edger Cole. Yeah, definitely rest in peace to them. And y'all let me know in the comments of any of the members who are no longer with us. Let their names live on. Pookie from CMG. You know what I'm saying? I'm happy to see that we all gonna come together. You know what I'm saying? Ain't nobody gonna be killing each other over the punk ass color again. You know what I'm saying? It's hard for me to be here with them, but you know what I'm saying? Fuck it. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. You know what I'm saying? It's a black man. You know what I'm saying? It's also a lot of OGs who put in work for the gang as well. Some of them include Lunch Meat, Frank Lewis, Sugar Booger, Bumpy Bars, KB, Kenny Boy, and Dane, with the last three being major contributors when it comes to the gang's foundation. They also have a lot of rappers who've made a lot of noise in the music scene over the years. For example, the Crenshaw Mafia gang 
along with the Denver Lanes, dominated the Damu Riders, a popular rap group in the 1990s, which included Lil Hawk, Big Y, Tiptoe, Pimp D, OG Mad Eye, and Spider, also known as SP. Some other rappers include Trap and Trez. Yeah, bro's definitely hard. He has a catchy ass flow, but is also chill with a lot of funny punchlines. Y'all tap into his mafia ties to get an idea of what I'm talking about. It's also Scrams, and bro definitely does his shit when it comes to the raps as well. He's been at it for a couple years now with his funny ass delivery and hardcore lyrics. He definitely needs some more shine. So y'all tap in and pull up to see what I mean. Other rappers include TYZ Active, Hit Up Brazy, YG Bams, BT The Shasta, and Finesse B. Y'all definitely tap in and let me know if any other rappers I didn't mention. Let's get their music heard. Danger Raiden for the Crenshaw Mafia Gangsta Bloods. When it comes to the Crenshaw Mafia Gangsta Bloods, this gang has made noise around Los Angeles since the 1980s. And they have more than a few prominent figures who have earned the gang its fear reputation. Y'all heard the stories, but honestly, those only scratch the surface of how intense and ruthless this gang has been. Yeah, with multiple gang wars, injunctions, and stories around the city, the Crenshaw Mafia Gangster Bloods are definitely a set that doesn't play any games. That's why they're going to receive a danger rating of a 9.5 out of 10 based off of the gang's violent history in the city of Inglewood and beyond. Ask about the Crenshaw Mafia Gangster Bloods. These thugs are known for their ruthless ways. With this gang, it's definitely no love. Bars, nigga. Nah, even though this gang's area is known for being in the middle of being gentrified, they're definitely still around. The crazy part is that they're known in Los Angeles for their brutal ways, but also beyond, and have several insane stories of their violent ways, including a situation that occurred in Linwood, California in 2004. On December 10th of 2004, Gloria King went to a Christmas parade in a city in Linwood with her friend Stacy Gaines and several of her family members. King had formerly dated Stacy and met his nephew, Demarius Gaines, who was also known as Peanut. Stacy and Peanut, they were both members of the Crenshaw Mafia Blood Gang, as well as Ramsey, who was known as Hitman, and Mac, who was known as Tiny O. Without the parade watching the festivities, Stacy was approached by and assaulted by several men. After the assault, Peanut and his girlfriend, Nadia Vidado, drove Stacy and King to King's apartment in Vidado's white Dodge Intrepid. King, she lived on a street claimed by the Linwood neighborhood Crips. So to avoid trouble, Stacy stayed the night at King's home. The next morning, King's niece answered the telephone and spoke with someone. After her conversation, she asked King why they want to fight Stacy. King saw two cars outside with people whom she believed to be Linwood gang members milling around the cars. So to avoid issues, Stacy gathered his belongings and called Peanut to pick him up. Shortly after, Peanut arrived with Ramsey and Mac and went to King's apartment where Stacy was waiting. King accompanied Stacy and the three other men to the front of the apartment building, where the right intrepid was parked. Two cars King had seen earlier, they were gone. But King and the others had to walk past two young men outside. One of them was AJ, and the other, he was later identified as Marcus Henson. Henson, he was kneeling or squatting down next to the building, and AJ was standing there. And once AJ seen a group approaching, he started to approach the men. And while walking up to Peanut, AJ said to him, What's up, cuz? Peanut looked shocked, and he replied, What's up, blood? So AJ moved closer and repeated, What's up, cuz? With more force. Peanut then said, Blood, you don't want no problem. And he started reaching towards his waist area. King glanced away, and when he looked again, Peanut had his arms fully extended at shoulder level, and King heard gunshots. Peanut's arm 
was 16 to 18 inches away from AJ's face right before King heard the gunshot. After that, King immediately ran. And from a hiding spot, she saw Mac aiming something towards AJ's friend. King was not able to see whether there was a weapon in Peanuts or Mac's hand because their backs were turned towards her. And she never saw Ramsey with the gun, but she heard 12 or 13 shots. Right after that, King saw that Vendito was at the wheel of the Intrepid. She seen Vendito make a U-turn before Stacy, Peanut, Mac, and Ramsey ran towards the car and got in. As they passed King, the passenger door flung open and Peanut pulled King into the car. In that moment, the Dito was hysterical as the man noisily directed her to a freeway. Peanut, who was in the front passenger seat, spoke towards the general direction of the back seat and said, you ain't have to shoot him that many times, blood. King saw that Mac had a small gun that he was putting away in his pocket. She never saw a peanut with the gun or felt the gun on him while she lay across his lap. Vendito eventually dropped off Ramsey and Mac in Englewood. And as Ramsey got out the car, Stacy told Ramsey, get your shit, blood. So Ramsey removed the box with a picture of bullets on it from the car. The next day, King called the police and told them what she saw. Police interviewed her and showed her a set of photographs. She circled Peanut's photograph and wrote, he's the closest one that shot AJ, Stacy's nephew. She circled Mac's photograph and wrote that she saw him with a gun in his pocket in the car and that he also shot AJ. Henson also testified that he saw Peanut turn around and get a gun from the person behind him, Mac. Henson also said he saw Peanut shoot AJ at least once in the head and perhaps three times in all before running away from the scene. In addition to the several witnesses who testified or wrote statements, a detective also obtained a court order authorizing monitoring of jail cells of Tiny O and Hitman. The first one was a recording of Ramsey, who was alone. Ramsey said, Nigga, motherfucking bitch said it was me. That bitch gotta bring her ass to court though. She don't care. I swear, I might just kill her. Left me hanging in this motherfucker. Ramsey then prayed for help and swore that he would change his way of living. He then went back on his rant, saying, Punk ass nigga snitching on a nigga. After that, he whispered to himself, What the fuck did you see? I didn't even know what the fuck you saw. Shortly after, he was joined in the cell by Mac. Ramsey said, Okay, you saw the whole whoop. All the evidence is against us. I think they'll say that little nigga will come to court. Mac then reassures Ramsey that the little dude will say he doesn't know what happened. Ramsey also says, I've been talking about my alibi. Like, I got an alibi. I got an alibi. But see, niggas don't even know if that's the defense my folks want me to take or not. They probably want me to say a nigga was there, but you don't know anything about that type of shit. He added. He also added, you could snitch, spill, and be home by now. You could have did that but you didn't bring that up. I got that much more love for you, blood. Ramsey then implied that the cops had told them that Mac was snitching. And Mac replied, if I told man, you know I wouldn't be in here with you, nigga. Ramsey replied, I already know, homie. After trying to fight the case, Peanut eventually came up short due to all the evidence against him. And the trial court sentenced Peanut to a state prison term of 40 years to life. Man, rest in peace to Andre Jackson, who was also known as AJ. Even though he seemed to be the aggressor in this whole situation, the end result was still sad for him, with his life being taken in the process. Through all these stories, you can see how ruthless this gang has been, which made them the target of a lot of takedowns and injunctions. But let's get into the current state of the Crenshaw Mafia Gangsta Bloods to see if they're still functioning today. Current state of the Crenshaw Mafia against the Bloods. In 1997, the city of Inglewood served the CMGs with a gang injunction, an effort to displace the gang as developers rebuilt the Century Corridor with the new Costco, Red Lobster, Office Depot, Bath and Body Works, and over a dozen banks, restaurants, and retail stores. 
In addition, there's a few new stadiums and other attractions that are now being housed in Inglewood, like the SoFi Stadium and a YouTube theater. So it's definitely safe to say this area has been greatly gentrified. Due to these factors, they're probably half the size they used to be compared to the 80s and 90s. The gang is still active in the Bottoms community of Inglewood, but due to demographic shifts and urban development, the gang's presence has dropped a lot. Despite all that, the Crenshaw Mafia Gangster Bloods are still very active and still thriving to this day. And even if grown to the point so they have subsets in different states, including Texas, Tennessee, Maryland, and Denver, Colorado. And this subset is known for its violent ways as well. Matter of fact, in November of 2014, David Scott, a member of the Crenshaw Mafia, killed two Crips in Denver. With Scott been eventually sentenced to 30 years in federal prison. Y'all let me know in the comments of any other state this gang is known in. Anyways, that's it for the Crenshaw Mafias. Hopefully y'all enjoyed it. Did I miss anything? Did I get something wrong? Y'all let me know in the comments. Let's have a conversation about it. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. It's a lot more coming. Or like the video if you're already part of the Danger Game. Y'all stay safe or dangerous out there.